Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to The Wellness Coach on Block Talk Radio. I'm your host, Edie Summers, and I'm really excited. We have a really amazing guest today, Darren Littlejohn. He's a best-selling author, retreat leader, certified yoga teacher, and a certified Reiki healing practitioner, a recovering addict and a practitioner of Zen and Tibetan Buddhism, as well as a former mental health specialist. He earned a BA in psych in 1991 and worked in chemical dependency and acute psychiatric care facilities during college. Darren took two years of graduate school in research methods for psychology. He has been a Buddhist practitioner since the mid-80s. A spiritual crisis led to a relapse in 1994 with 10 years of sobriety. After gaining sobriety in 1997, Darren worked on recovery with a new zeal, incorporating many years of psychotherapy, 12-step work, Zen and Tibetan Buddhist practices. While relapse with long-term sobriety is common, returning for a sustained duration is extremely rare. Darren's program, which became the basis for the book, The Twelve-Step Buddhist, is an integrated approach that is hard won over a span of more than 20 years. Darren, a jazz guitarist and dog lover, now lives in Portland, Oregon with his life partner of 15 years and their four dogs. He's been involved in many community projects, including the fight against smoking, creating dog parks, community television, and a spiritually driven jazz program. So, Darren, I just wanted to welcome you to the show today. Thank you so much for being here. How are you? I'm super great. Thanks so much for having me. Well, it's my pleasure, and it's my honor. And um, we have a lot of ground to cover. Um, I'm wondering, um, first of all, um, I think probably most people know you, well, people will know you probably for many different reasons, but the 12-step Buddhist. Um, might be a reason that people know you. And I'm wondering if um, you could give our listeners just a background on, maybe just your background story, just to kind of get us started. Um, My background story, well, also um, on many dimensions, right? So um, in terms of probably the most uh, important uh, for this conversation, sort of the addiction history, Mm-hmm. Um, if that's what you mean, I mean, I, I, I started um, in about the middle of seventh grade uh, with drugs and alcohol, and it completely stopped me in my tracks um, in terms of my ability to suddenly feel okay and when I never, you know, never had that ability before. I was always in some sort of um, what I know now to be a sort of a, a, an acute chronic unrest which we know is sort of the, the state of mind of the addict. Then, uh, again, also, if you listen to Buddha, the state of mind of all, all beings, really. Um, but in the addict, you know, so much more pronounced with all of the addiction. So I started with that, and it really, really stopped me in terms of my ability to function, uh, you know, in school and so forth. So I continued on that uh, path, really going full bore into drugs and alcohol, uh, until I was 22, and I got sober in a treatment center in, in San Jose, California, um, back then, they had 30-day treatment centers, uh, uh, you know, paid for by insurance. I, I don't think they really have too much of that uh, these days. But um, it's usually three days, seven days, something like that. But I was fortunate to get into a nice uh, program and um, and then participate following that in the 12-step recovery. Um, and I stayed sober in the 12-step community, uh, primarily using that uh, for just about a decade. Mm-hmm. And I got into some uh, what what I call the funnel. I got into a, a, a kind of a dark spot, sort of uh, you might call it a existential crisis or a spiritual dilemma, or or or, or a really bad depression. And uh, I decided that it would be a great idea um, <laughs> now that my mind was clear, and now that I had all, all these years of uh, you know uh, education and psychology and meditation, I thought it would be a great idea to take some LSD 
and pursue my meditation practice that way. <laughs> we can laugh now. But yeah, right. <laughs> but at the time, I was quite serious. And uh, mm-hmm. I had some penetrating insights, um, mainly into just how deep and dark that black hole was. And uh, it just left me, it left me really uh, messed up. So it took me uh, several years to actually come back around and become willing to uh, enter into sobriety again. That was 1997. And I've been clean and sober um, since 97, so I'm, I'm going to have 16 years coming up here in December. Wow, which is that's incredible. That yeah, that's that dimension. That's that dimension. <laughs> and and there, are there any other, and of course we're going to go deeper into all of this, and of course we're going to be talking about your new book, The Power of Vow, which I'm incredibly curious about. I, I have a basic, very, very basic understanding of Buddhism to the point where I consider myself a Buddhist. However... That is, I, I mean, compared to what you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to learning a lot here. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of other people will too because, you know, you seem like you have mastered the subject of Buddhism. Oh, no. But, um, there's no, there's no, there's no, mas- there's no well, mastery uh, possible. Uh, there's no mastery mm-hmm. until you at- attain Buddhahood. But I, I think mm-hmm. about it a lot and I wor- I've worked with it a lot. So I think I'm probably a little bit ahead in terms of that experience and knowledge in some people. But. Um, definitely there are real masters who really, really um, apply and manifest the potential of the teachings, and I would never try to put myself in that same category. Mm. Well, I just have to say, for anyone who hasn't read your first book, The Twelve Step Buddhist, um, you go into great detail and um, about Buddhism and how, and you actually um, sort of, if I understand it correctly, like you mentioned, you went through this, the Twelve Step program, and yet you also add – now, did you originally add um, Buddhism into that, the 12-step program, or was that something that came to you down the road? No, the way, the way, it, generally, the way it generally works is, you know, in the 12-step literature, um, it says, hey, we don't know everything, and you should go read books and learn stuff and maybe go back to your original um, you know, spiritual tradition and so on. So, you know, um, that's – you know, if you take that literally, which is how I take it, and I take that seriously, I try to apply uh, what I learn. But, you know, the, the problem in the 12-step culture is that, um, there, you know, it's really a predominantly sort of uh, Christian-oriented, whether or not we use those terms, the, mm-hmm. the, uh, the, the theological concept, you know, the monotheistic concept is definitely uh, – you know, kind of one one dimensional, even though people mm-hmm. talk about the options. So I started studying um, all different types of spiritual matter as soon as I could when I got through my steps. And I started to apply those. But the thing is that you don't really have, you're sort of on, on your own out there in terms of what you might wander into or discover, you know, in terms of a teaching, a teacher. A, a, a place, a group, community to practice with, right? So I never mm-hmm. really found anybody to hang out with that I could deal with until um, much, much later. And okay. that was um, still a little bit, it was still a little bit challenging in terms of fitting my my mentality and my orientation as a recovering addict into the communities where people were studying and practicing Buddhism. So that's really what my work's personally been about as well as what I've written about in the 12-step Buddhist in, in the new book as well. Mm-hmm. And so um, before we go deeper into your new book, um, could you tell us what is the power of vow? Um, I, and there, I mean, there are many areas I want to cover here, but I think that, that might be a question that people might be even wondering. Um, just what, is on the, the book? On the what is the book or, or, or what, what is what the is the, what does the power of vow mean? Well, the power of vow really um, comes from the idea of surrender to win, which is a real uh, common uh, phrase that you'll hear in the 12-step folk wisdom. You know, this is the kind of stuff that, you know, they would say, look, when you come in, um, you've got to drop your, your, you know, uh, weapon and, you know, join the parade Mm -hmm. and, you know, quit fighting everything. And when you do that, you know, you'll break through your denial and, you know, you surrender to a power greater than yourself and eventually you'll come out ahead if you do that. So it's the concept of sort of the spiritual paradox of surrender to win. And when we think about uh, vows, which, you know, I go into details in terms of what the 
you know, different sort of levels of vows are in different traditions and secular, you know, versus versus religious and, and Buddhist and what have you. But, you know, in general, if you just look right away to a Buddhist vow, such as um, I take refuge in the Buddha, you might think um, on the face of it that you've got to give up something. Or if you take the vow um, not to harm, for example, people automatically feel like you're giving up uh, some of your pleasures, some of your attachments, some of the things that you really want, some of the things you really don't want to give up, you know. So the power actually comes when we, if we understand a, some basic principle that Buddha talked about, and if we understand, you know, the situation that we're living in as being, you know, and that context gives us the framework uh, to make an educated decision that we might do out loud uh, in front of other people, for example, if you went to a, a, a refuge ceremony in the Buddhist Sangha or something. You know, if you understand what you're doing and uh, why you're doing it, then the power comes from that. So you're, you educate yourself into what's happening and you, and you take some action. And when you do that, you wind up in um, a, much, a much better situation um, than if you just sort of, you know, followed along because somebody else thought, thought it was a good idea or did it for some other, some other reason. Mm-hmm. So is it doing it with intention Is that and also saying it out loud? Are those two key components? Those are key components. And, you know, while I do say in the book that, you know, if you wanted to take refuge in the Buddha, uh, you don't necessarily have to go to a traditional situation where you're going to go in front of a group of people and do it out loud and so forth. But you can. And if you want to, you should. Um, mm-hmm. But the idea is when you have the intention, but you can't really – you know, intention is one of those sort of spiritual bypassing words that you hear <laughs> a lot of in, spirit, mm. in spiritual communities and yoga, you know, studios and mm. so forth. You know, people just think intention like they think mindfulness, and it's very, it's usually very surface. But when you have education about the, um, you know, the various uh, aspects of the situation, then your intention is, you know, much clearer and much sharper, and it has a lot more. Mm power and a lot more potential. Right. And um and I um I, I don't think our listeners heard that. There was a little bit of static there, but I think that um hopefully our listeners didn't hear that. Um Darren, I just want to um before we go deeper into the power of vow, for anyone who's listening, there might be people listening who are struggling with addiction and there also might be people and or people listening who are curious about Buddhism. Um, and also yoga, um, and I also. So I'm curious if you could maybe, uh, first of all, if someone is dealing with addiction, um, and just from your experience and point of view, I'm just wondering if you could give them some um, tips for like where to begin. Um, like what it, what was it for you that. Um, maybe got you into treatment the first time or what worked for you the second time? I'm just wondering if you could go a little bit deeper into just maybe giving, giving somebody some tips. Yeah. I mean, those are really two different stories and they're, and, and okay. really different situations, but, um, mm-hmm. it, 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 and I did really in detail in the 12 step Buddhist, like the first couple of chapters discuss that story of the second okay. time, but you know, the first time okay. there's somebody who doesn't, Somebody who doesn't understand what's happening in in their addiction, um, but they're getting into some kind of trouble, and they're finding it to uh, in the way of their their life and affect their relationships and so forth. You know, there are really a couple of different kind of people. Uh, one uh, is the person who's an abuser, and they they do it to excess, whatever it is, process, substance, you know, people. Um, and that person, you know, if they get a DUI or something, you know, and the judge says, "Hey, you're gonna, you're gonna go to jail if you don't stop this." That that person who's an abuser, who still has a serious issue, but isn't quite a, someone who's got the level of dependency which makes you an addict. Um, that person can stop given sufficient reason. So mm-hmm. they 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 say, "Yeah, you know what? My life is kind of being affected by this." And you know, like like everybody dr- drinks in college, you know. And, and you know, everybody's kind of an alcoholic as they're going out night after night. And then when they get out of college, the people who are not alcoholic get jobs and families, and they're, they're cool. Maybe they drink on the weekends sometime where people like me, 
actually um, don't stop, and they, they might get a job and lose it because of the party and so much. So there, there's another kind of person that, that, that's chemically dependent, and you know nobody knows what that which one you are, so you should explore that. The first thing that you should do is try to get some education about that by seeing a treatment counselor, um, attending some 12-step meetings, reading some of the 12-step literature, and try to be you know, get really honest about where you're at and you know, inevitably, you know, most people don't think that they're, they've really gone so far into the full bore addiction, and and that's part of the process of education and and and, and familiarizing oneself with, you know, what the, the mechanisms and components of addiction are, and you know, getting to that denial. And if and if you find out that hey, you can stop given sufficient reason, then just stop, and you're fine. If you can't, then then there are then there are some more serious solutions like long-term involvement in psychotherapy and uh, 12-step communities and, and so on. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I hear you saying is that if, so maybe someone will, if someone can't stop, then that might be the defining factor for seeking help. It really is. And, and, and if they can't stop, that's a very, very serious indication. And, uh, there, and, and people should know that there is really a major difference in the way our brains function when we are chemically dependent. And when we say chemically, you know, really that could include you know, other things. But uh, primary, primarily they talk about chemicals, you know. There, although there's some, there's some evidence that stuff like gambling affects the brain in the same way, although it's not really conclusive. So the, um, the red flags are there. You already know if you're, if you're struggling. You already know. You've heard it a million times. You've been threatened enough by your boss's, spouse's, parents, friends, family. You already know. So, you know, you just have to decide when it's time to make a move and get really honest, you know, and quit fighting, surrender to win. Hmm. And then, and, and I love, um, and I love how you say that, the surrender to win, and we're going to go, um, we're going to talk um, more about about that. Um, so I'm curious, though, what was the difference between the first time and the second time? Is there a way to compare them? Well, well yeah, sure. I mean, the first time, it's like this. It's just like the power of mindfulness practice, you know. If I if I sit and, and 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 become aware and willing to you know, experience what is arising in my mind and my body and so on, then the power of that awareness you know, is really strong, and you can really heal a lot of stuff just from being aware of it, right? And a lot of the work that I do in the workshops and retreats, the shadow work, voice dialogues, and so forth, it's the same thing when you're writing a fourth step inventory in your twelfth step, or you're talking honestly with your therapist or something. You know, you really get aware, and the awareness ha- in it uh, in and of itself is tremendously powerful. Mm-hmm. But um, when you when, so when I when I first started in recovery, I was not aware that there was a thing called addiction, and that I was one of them, and that there was a solution, and that there was treatment. And as soon as I heard about it, I went, "Wow, amazing, unbelievable, mm-hmm. I love it." You know, so mm-hmm. that that was my my mindset the first time through. When you go. When you go through a decade of, you know, thousands of 12-step meetings and, you know, doing a lot of work in the field and studying it from the perspective of psychology and so on, it's much different when you start drinking and using again. You don't have that sort of fresh, uh, naive mm-hmm. day, right? You don't have that, mm-hmm. that lack of knowledge. You already know. Right. And, the, and actually, that, that knowledge gets in the way. Mm-hmm. The knowledge gets in the way because it's very, it's very difficult for anybody to tell you anything. Someone will come <laughs> and will say, hey, man, surrender to win, and you'll be like, Fuck you. You know, I already know that. I was, tell, I was telling people that when you were still drinking. <laughs> so become, you become much more clever. The, um, it's much more, would you say, I, I mean, I don't know. I'm curious. Did, was it much more challenging to stop a second time or oh, what, yeah. since you knew my, more? It was ridiculous because you can't, the thing is, is that you can't erase the knowledge and experience from a decade of recovery, and this is the problem with every single every single person that I've ever met who's relapsed with long term sobriety. You know, we all have the same problem. You know, in many others, but you know, one of them is that we know too much and we think we know too much. Just for example, there was there was a woman who, um, when I met her, she had six months sober, and she used to have fifteen years sober, and she was, you know. Wow kind of a you know, practicing attorney, professional person and all this stuff. And she knew how to speak and so on. When she talked at a meeting, 
she talked like she was the person with 15 years sober. Mm -hmm. With all the experience and all the advice and all the wisdom, one time I said to her, person who remains nameless, I said, person, (laughs) you're full of shit. Because you're not talking like the person who has six months or a year sober. You're talking Mm -hmm. like the person who has 15 years, and you better come to terms with it or you're not going to stay sober. Mm-hmm. This was my, you know, my, my wisdom or my, my belligerent advice at the time. So this <laughs> is the same kind of thing that happens. You know, you can't erase it. Now, here's the thing. You still have, it's true, you still have the experience and the knowledge. Here's the problem. Your lens is distorted. <laughs> You're not seeing it clearly. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You can't see it clearly. Oh, I'm powerless over alcohol. My life is unmanageable. Yeah, I already know that. Well, really, <laughs> if you really knew that, if you really knew that, you know, how would you sound? How would you feel? What would you be doing? So there's a big difference. And you know what? This is the same. I mentioned spiritual bypassing. And my most recent podcast is on this topic. Mm-hmm. And, and it's something I'm really spending a lot of time uh, trying to understand these days. But, you know, it's really mm-hmm. easy to have intellectual knowledge. So, so people will come yes. into a 12-step meeting and they'll look up at the wall and say, oh, I've, I did the steps. They read them. <laughs> well, it's, a, it, it's an experience. It's like it's like looking at a yo. It's like watching a yoga class from outside the studio. Mm-hmm. And saying, I know every. I know everything. I know all about yoga now. Right. I saw those people, you know, in that pose, and and, and you really you really have to have with twelve <laughs> steps with Buddhism, you know, with any spiritual discipline, you have to have experience, and it takes time. Mm-hmm. There's really no shortcut. It takes mm-hmm. time. It takes time. And, and also, I hear you. When, 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 no, I was just going to finish with that. Is that when you when you come back again the second time or third or whatever number of times through, and you have mm-hmm. all of your previous experience, the, the real problem is knowing how to shut up and listen <laughs> to stuff that you've heard a million times and to try to do it in a new way in this fresh moment. You okay. know what I mean? It's like coming yeah. into it's like doing a chaturanga for the four thousandth time. It's like okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, high level push up, inhale up dog, exhale down dog. No, this is a new, this is a new up dog. It's right. a new breath. It's a new moment. Very, very mm-hmm. advanced to be able to to do the stuff that you've heard over and over, and to do it with a fresh mind. And that's a fresh mind. Something that most most people don't have that ability because we we think we know too much. And and so doing things with a fresh mind um, is is clearly being in the present moment, which is something I know that you specialize in. And and also I, I heard you talking about discipline and it's the practice of it. Is it is it the practice of being sober? I mean I'm curious, what is it that keeps you sober specifically? Well, let me address what you said. That, that something I specialize in. Being in the present moment is something something that I struggle with on an excruciating level every single second of my life, just like anybody else who's serious about it. Right? Mm-hmm. It is the most difficult thing to do. It's like standing under Niagara Falls, holding your palm up, trying to stop the flood. It's mm. really tough. So it's not mm-hmm. an easy thing. And, and people who say it is, are, you know, they're, they're, not quite, they're not quite understanding you know, what's going on because it's not easy to be in the present moment. And once you're there, you know, uh, then what? You know, the mind starts to think right. and thinking, and what's happening <laughs> right. now? You know what I mean? Hey, now what? The mind... <laughs> You start meditating, and it's like suddenly you're, you know, people don't like Aleister Crowley. I guess he was a crazy man. But he's had some really <laughs> interesting things to say about people who start meditating, and they think, oh, yeah, now I've, mas- now, now I've, really, I've really mastered this, you know. And they don't really realize that as you get into the next level is when the mind becomes much more cunning, baffling, and powerful. You talked about being clever. We have a uh-huh. statement in 12-step about being clever. The smarter I get about my disease, the smarter my disease gets about me. Mm-hmm. And it's the mm-hmm. same with the mind. It's mm-hmm. the same with, with practicing. So to then answer your question, what keeps me sober today, the thing is is that I do a lot of work. I mean, I, I have a multifaceted, comprehensive re- approach to recovery. I have, one of my things is integrate, don't separate. So, I mean, I utilize mm-hmm. a lot of different mm-hmm. tools. And when I utilize these different tools, people that are kind of unfamiliar with 12-step think it's great. People who refuse to do 12-step want to do that instead of 12-step. And people within 12-step are terrified of you, <laughs> you know, because it's a little bit, like, you know, it's kind, of, it's kind of scary to tell people, hey, there's more stuff that you could be doing that will help you in the long haul. Mm-hmm. 
You know what I mean? So the stuff right. that I do in recovery now involves, you know, I teach fitness and yoga classes. I take yoga classes. I read and study. I, I write books. I listen to spiritual teachings. I try to follow my Tibetan teacher as best of my ability and to apply the things that he talks about over and over and over. And, okay. um, you know, I try to focus on my nutrition and so on. And I go to meetings. I go to mm-hmm. meetings and I try to, you know, just hang out in the meeting and uh, and, and do my part. Um, so there there are many things. And I just realized that it, I didn't just realize this, but, I mean, it's really clear to me now that if I just mm-hmm. went to 12-step meetings, I'd lose my mind. <laughs> if I just went to 12-step meetings, there's absolutely no way that I could evolve. But if I didn't go to 12-step meetings, there's absolutely no way that I could evolve and I would lose my mind. So, so I've got to do the sort of overall approach. And so, I, what, so what I heard you saying is that you do an integrated, integrated approach. That is 100% correct. You're really yeah. listening to me, and I appreciate that. Um, that's uh, one of the one of the one of the many things that we learn in in counseling. And yet, you you studied uh, psychology too as well. And, and do you, do you did you study psychology? I'm curious. Did you study it to help yourself, or was it a combination of reasons? I'm just I'm curious. Well, I mean, you already know the answer to that question. I mean, there's nobody who's studying <laughs> psychology who's not trying to help himself. You know. But the thing is that. The thing is, I went in knowing that. I, I went in because I had an epiphany doing uh, the, the book, um, I forget what year it was, but mid-'80s, you know, What Color Is Your Parachute? And they've, they've, mm-hmm. they've still got uh, uh, new, new editions come out of that. And, and what I uncovered I at the time was it's fantastic. It helps you, it it helps you uncover what your, what your real desire is. I wanted to be it, a spiritual it's great, and yeah. counselor. <laughs> and they didn't, have, they didn't have trainings in spiritually oriented counseling at the time. I mean, the, uh, mm-hmm. Those are uh, a college in San Francisco that started doing it um, and transpersonal psychology and so on. But it really was kind of make your own way, and, and now it's much more fashionable. Um, but, yeah, right. I went into it because I'm a speaker. I've been a speaker forever since I was a child, you know, and uh, I want to know more. I want to understand, and um, I'm still quite puzzled, actually, so I, I have to keep speaking. And and it is – and you're, you're right, it is also um... – I think that profession is evolving as well, and it is becoming more spiritually oriented and more immediate. And um, um, but you're right; I think a lot of people do get into it because we're, of course, we're always seeking answers for ourselves. Um, and that's. And speaking of, um, we have a question here. Um, this is from Rich. Um, what is the proper role of one's past? How do I stay in the present when there is this emphasis on the past? Well, maybe he maybe he means the emphasis on the past in the 12-step world. And, you know, this is a really interesting question because in, um, you know, I had this conversation with Deepak Chopra on his radio show one time. You know, mm. he, he says the longer you, every time you identify as an addict, you know, you're keeping yourself stuck more or less, you know. And that's, mm-hmm. actually, hmm. that's actually bullshit because if you don't <laughs> continually remind yourself of your condition, then you can delude yourself into thinking that you've overcome your condition. My condition is that in my molecules and my DNA and my genetics, you know, and all my, my um, history and training and all of my um, habits and behaviors and memories in my brain, in the way that my brain operates, I'm an addict. And um, my mm-hmm. condition of um, ego tells me, ah, come on. You're over that. You haven't had a drink in almost 16 years. You can go to the strip club and sit there and you know, watch the young ladies and have, have a cocktail. <laughs> well, you know, my mind is going to do that probably till the day I die, right? <laughs> my mind is going to tell me, you know, you know, you know how nice that whiskey smells when it first, you know how great a line of cocaine would be. <laughs> oh, the marijuana, you know, marijuana is legal in, 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 in Washington, right? <laughs> marijuana is legal. This is like the church, right? The never-ending, uh, so, the ways that your mind tries to convince you. Yeah, that's right. There's an impulse. Give it one more try. And, mm. and, and no matter mm. what, I will tell you no matter what, yeah, it's not that. So if I don't remind myself of that, so there's reminding myself of that by going in, they're sharing with the newcomer by saying, okay, you know, I'm an alcoholic, and this is what it was like for me. This is what happened, and this is what it's like now. 
There's that. Mm-hmm. And there's doing mm-hmm. that from a healthy perspective, and there's doing that from what my shaman uh, mentor, Rosemary Bean, she calls it, you know, rewounding, right? So mm-hmm. you can stay stuck. This is a really big problem in 12 seconds. The bar is pretty low. And people don't feel <laughs> like they have – people don't have – People don't really have a lot of self-worth a lot of the times, you know, mm. and people don't really feel that much. They have a lot of self-loathing, and we all do, and it's just, <laughs> it's really hard for us to feel like we can aspire to something beyond, you know, staying sober for the day or, mm-hmm. or, or whatever, you know, and some people do. I'm not saying, some people do, and, and you know, I'm not putting people down. I'm just saying that in, in, a, in a lot of ways, it's really tough just to, um, just to do the regular old one-day-at-a-time program, you know. So we have to remind ourselves, but what happens is that we stay stuck in just that part. And, and, and we don't, there, there's a way to, this is the same as the problem that I described to you when I came back in, I had a decade of experience, and I had to somehow forget all of that while I somehow remembered all that. Mm, you know, it's right. some, it, simultaneously. It, it, it's, like, it's like that yin yang of yoga, you know, when you're in a pose, you know. Mm-hmm. Somehow you're you're pushing and you're stretching and you, and you and you're trying really hard and yet you're really relaxing. You know you have to practice contentment while you're practicing exertion. And somehow mm-hmm. there's a balance between being able to reconcile the past and to understand the truth of the past and acknowledge mm-hmm. the past so that it doesn't sneak up on you in a different disguise. Oh hi, I'm the past. I've got a new hat. I know you don't recognize me. Let's have a drink. You know. And at the same Let's time, try to be healthy and move forward. you know what I mean? At the same time, <laughs> I know I'm an addict. I know mm. I'm an addict. Please, please don't ever try to tell me I'm not. I mean, I, mm. I, had, a, I had a guy, I had a, we had a teacher come in that came, that came out, and uh, I'm supposed to be really respectful of the teachers, you know. And we're sitting <laughs> in my living room, and we're doing a practice which involves, you know, it's a wine, it's a wine offering. And I've got a bunch of people there from AA and stuff, you know. And... Um, and he said something like, "Well, you know, we have there is a practice where we try to go, we try to get non-dual, we try to go past our limitations, you know. But mm. come on, we have to understand what mm-hmm. our limitations are." In the and beginning, he said something about, "Yeah, he said something about, well, you know, uh, you could just drink the wine, just don't drink, too, just have just a bunch." And I looked at him and I just, I flipped him off and I said, "I, I just flipped him off right in his face." I said, "You don't understand anything about addiction, and don't tell mm-hmm. these people that in my living room." Mm-hmm. Because you have to understand mm-hmm. the past. Now, at the same time, I understand the past. I'm also trying to move forward. Thank you, but I'm not right. for shutting the door on the past. We don't want to. We don't regret the past nor shut the door on it. And there's a there's a healthy okay. there's a healthful way to do it. You know. Mm-hmm. And so, okay. So what I hear you saying, and um, I'm wondering if this answers Rich's question, is that the past is it the the past is kind of a reminder that you you were an addict. Is that or is no, that too much of a, no a leap? Thing. There's no such thing as were. Here's the problem. There's okay. no such thing as were. There's no okay. such thing as were. If you're an abuser and not a chemically dependent and your and your mesolimbic reward system isn't effed up like a reptile, you know what I mean? <laughs> then you can stop with sufficient reason. Then you can say I were I were a problem drinker, okay? <laughs> but if you crossed over into that gray zone and the gray matter, there is no were. There might be a were if, you know, you're a yogi for like the next hundred years and you can like levitate and walk through walls and, you're, and, you're, and you're, your guru says to you, you know what, you're not an alcoholic anymore. Check with your sponsor. Go to a meeting and make sure that... <laughs> Okay. Check with your. You get my point. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but unless you can have yeah. magical powers, you know, that are really, really, you know, out there. According to the ancient texts, you know, these yogis had magical powers. They could, they could just, they could go thousands of miles in, in, a, in a couple minutes. You know, if you can do that kind of magical feat, I don't know. The only way to prove whether or not you're still an addict is to try. And if you're wrong, ooh, mm-hmm. you just lost a hundred years of sobriety. <laughs> And then, oh, now that's a quote. Um, so now, that's okay. So it's it's a it's a great one. Um, okay, so I'm I'm very okay. So one of the, the you have a line about attachment, and now in psychology, of course, there's um, attachment theory of, of you know everyone yeah. has um, attachments when we're growing up, but th- that's not the kind of attachment that you're talking about. Is that correct? Well, it's not the kind Is of that, attachment that Buddha talked about. 
that's not the kind so of there's okay. attachment, attachment attachment theory says you know separation individuation you know my mommy's nice I'm attached to her in a healthy way and when it's time for me to move on if she lets me then um, <laughs> I can move on I know she's there I know she's there and I can kind of explore the world and everything's cool if she won't let me explore the world because she needs to be needed, then we've got problems, right? <laughs> but um, you know, there's healthy attachment, right? And from a psychology right. point of view, it's just a different word. It's just a different word. Well, you know, from right. a Buddhist point of view, uh, attachment means um, clinging, you know, to what we crave. Mm, and that's interesting. Also very similar. It's also on the, uh, if you take that on the left, so that's on, that point is on the on the far left, okay. And then you take that on the way? all the way to the far right. It's on the far left. Okay. You look at the continuum. It's, a, it's yes. a horizontal line. Way over in minus 100 is attachment. You go to the zero <laughs> point, you go all the way to the right, and you go to plus 100, there's addiction. Mm, it's the same continuum. Yes. It's the same principle. It's just, okay. you know, a, a addiction <clears throat> is attachment gone wild. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's another That's another great quote. And. And so I'm um, okay so my so my question is so we're ta- we're talking about always like always having like the the energy of an addict and like you were having this conversation with Deepak and he and what did he say again he said that you don't have to always be you just connected stuck. to that energy you're just identifying yourself you identify he wants identify. he wants you and you know you know Deepak's got a great point and it's part of Vedanta and you know the Panchad stuff and all the all the cool stuff the Ayurveda and stuff that he's into it's great but mm-hmm. You know, he's talking about you want to be, you know, open to the uh, field of unlimited potential, which is true. So, of course, it's true. Yes. But, but you can be open to the field of unlimited potential in a real feet on the ground kind of way, which right. means I will still have my dinner. I will still pay <laughs> my rent. I will still put, I will still put biodiesel in my Prius or whatever. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> You're still going to pay the bills. You're still going to show up. That's called being rooted in reality. This is the mm-hmm. planet we live on, okay? And at the same time, I'm I'm trying to sit on my meditation cushion and, and understand the field of limited potential. I'm trying to open my mind to new possibilities and try new things and grow and so forth. But there's a balance. We can't bypass. We can't go from um, I'm an addict and I'm smoking crack on the street to unlimited potential because I've got six months clean and sober. You know, I mean, we we can't bypass the floors. You got to go, you got to go up the staircase. You know, mm. and and go through the levels mm-hmm. and go through the pain. And sometimes you got to sit on the stairs, broken, sobbing, not knowing if you should go back down or if you should go forward. I mean, it's a path. It's a process. There are no shortcuts. And it's too mm. easy to hear spiritual teachings and say, oh, um, yeah, I get that, and but you don't mm-hmm. really get it because it takes mm-hmm. forever. You got to practice stuff. It takes. You know, you know what I mean? You gotta practice stuff. You gotta practice. I think I think that's what I keep hearing you saying and also that's my own experience is um it's the practice of of well being, it's the practice of being in the present moment. And it's a continual it's a continual it's an ongoing thing. It's like it's never ending. It's um but you go deeper and deeper a, into a, the present. A, yeah, you can go deeper in the present. And I used to say this and sometimes I have like shame flashbacks of when I used to do my earlier groups and I would I would kind of start yelling about this topic because, you know, people would say, oh, you mean mindfulness. Oh, yes, yeah, okay, I, I totally get that, you know. And it's like, well, you kind of really don't really get it because, honestly, <laughs> the moment is infinite. You know what I mean? Mm. And, you know, mm-hmm. we can kind of get it on one. You know, even if you start looking at the, uh, the uh, you know, the early, early writings, you know, the Upanishads uh, uh, or they start talking about the koshas and, you know, the different layers, you know. And you've got these different, you know, uh, uh, layers to penetrate. And you, know, you yeah. can get down to essence. You can get down to spirit. You can get down to the core truth. But, um, you know, it takes uh, – it, it, it's not something that you can just, um, you know, look at once and get it. And you get the accumulated wisdom over, over time. Like you can't really – you know, there's a reason why people are considered veterans and experts. I mean, what's the thing that uh, right. Gladwell says in, in Outliers you need – after you have 10,000 hours of experience, then you have expertise. Then you're a master. Oh, did he say that you're a master? Well, I, I don't know if I go that far, but, you know, it, <laughs> yeah. You know, you can't, when, there's something that you just, there's no way that you could know until 15 years has passed and you've been working on that topic and then suddenly you go, 
oh, my God, I can feel all these different pieces, you know, fall into place. And uh, I would have never known that had I not had that, that those years of experience. Mm. And so, okay. So then, okay, so we're talking about addiction, attachment um, or addiction, let's see, addiction as attachment gone wild, right? So, and then that. I know that, okay, and then I remember, um, so, and just one more mention about Deepak, because he has a book, and he talks about addiction, and he talks about how addicts are sp- really like spiritual seekers. What do you think about that? Yeah, like, I agree. I mean, okay. you know, it's it's really, it's really, the this is a great point, because I think that the most interesting people I've ever met in my life, I've met in 12-step recovery. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I'm not, I wow. noticed I said interesting. I didn't say functional. <laughs> so the people in 12 step recovery are fascinating, and we're, and we're fascinated mm. with ourselves, let's be honest. But mm. the, uh, <laughs> the kind of people, like I met a kid the other night, you know, I, was, I went to a meeting, and two people came up to me after the meeting and said, oh, I read your book in prison. <laughs> and I went, oh, That's great. I, if I, went, That's if great. I went over to Core Power Yoga, you know, when I go to core power yoga classes is where I train and, and where, where I practice, you know, nobody yes. comes up to me and says, oh, I read your book in prison. You know, it's like it, 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 there's really interesting people in recovery, and it, we're, we're the kind of people who, mm. for whom the uh, patent answers don't work. Mm. You know, we're the okay. kind of people who have, an, as my old 12-step sponsor used to hmm. say, you have an itch you can't scratch. Mm-hmm. And you know you're, okay. and, and the problem is you get you get frustrated. You get frustrated with your inability to answer the questions, and you start thinking that you can facilitate. You can create. Well, you learn that you can create a new experience for yourself chemically. Hmm. Right? And, that, and, and does that? Can, can, yeah. Okay. But does it? Scr- so it scratches that itch. But then it doesn't really. It doesn't heal it though. It makes it faster. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it makes it puss up and get bloody. And then you keep pouring more stuff on it and it gets deeper. Mm. So, it's, so not then, a real, it's not a real medicine. It's not the real medicine. It's not a real medicine. And so, the, dr- the, so drugs, then, the drugs of choice are not the real medicine. To the, it's a the spiritual question. We have a mm. thirst. So, so, we need, so we need direction. Mm. We need a guide. We need somebody to tell us, hey, here are the different teachings and here are some ways we can practice. And that's what I try to do. Because not everybody's as crazy as I am about all this. So not everybody wants to sit up at 4 o'clock in the morning reading ancient yoga texts, you know? <laughs> you know what I mean? So I try to explain it. I try, I try to tell my friend, you know, he's a great yogi. And, and he says, oh, that's all mumbo-jumbo, you know? It's all mumbo-jumbo to me. Mm-hmm. I say, well, look, I understand that it's not mumbo-jumbo to me. How can I kind of rephrase it? Which is really what I tried to do in, this, in The Power of Out. Mm-hmm. I really try to rephrase everything put it in very simple everyday language so that anybody, whether you're an addict or not or a Buddhist or not, you know, so that you can understand it and apply it right now in your life. And to me, that's really pretty easy. I mean, for most people, they hear a lot of stuff and, and they try to open up a spiritual text and it's a bunch of foreign words and they go, oh, that's dogmatic. I'm not, that's dogmatic and that's religious and I don't want it. You know, they shut the door before they even open it, you know. Mm. That's a great way of putting that. And um so let's so let's if you don't if you don't mind, let's let's talk about Buddhism. Um how can Buddhism help someone who's uh struggling with addiction? Well, it can help anybody if you think about that continuum, mm-hmm. right? So Buddha mm-hmm. said, you know, we've got a couple of couple three problems. Uh, uh attachment is one and uh uh, aversion is the other, and one of my teachers says, you know, aversion is attachment thwarted. So that means I don't get what I want. I want, you know, this is the way Robina says it. I want my chocolate cake, and I'm attached to my chocolate cake. I think my chocolate <laughs> cake is the source of all happiness, you know. And obviously, mm-hmm. if the chocolate cake was the source of all happiness, I would just back a Safeway truck up to my driveway, and I would just eat chocolate cake all day, and I would be blissful, and there'd be no problems. <laughs> but after the second. Uh. After the second yeah. or third piece, you're having a sugar coma and you're regurgitating <laughs> and developing a, a food addiction, right? <laughs> chocolate cake, I can be attached to, but it doesn't really. I become once I'm when I'm vomiting the chocolate cake, I, I, now I have an aversion. Now I have an aversion. 
Oh, okay. All no, of I see. these yes. things. Hmm. You get it? All of these things. Yes. Like my girlfriend. I love her. I got to have her. I can't live without her. We're, two, we're not two people. We're one person. We've known each other for so many lives. That's the first month. <laughs> Oh, then, then, go on. then six months later, her six months later, you know her cute little tendency to be so spontaneous and free. Well, she's undisciplined. She's out of control. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's, so we are we're attached, and then when we don't get what we want, we're we have a, the aversion. That's the mm. funny way of looking at it. But the, the idea is basically mm-hmm. that we have ignorance of our. What we really do is have ignorance of our Buddha nature. We have ignorance of our bliss mm. state. We have inner, in, ignorance of our actual true enlightened, you know, Sarah enlightened origin. Those are my words, right? So, and what, what was that again? Um, what was that again? The last I part? Just, I just said we have a we have attachment, ignorance, and aversion. And ignorance is really the problem. We don't, you know, it's called ma rigpa in Tibetan. So it just means not knowing, not knowing the, the truth, really, not knowing the real mm-hmm. condition. You know, and the real condition is not the BS that we see. The real condition is not the mental world. It's not the physical world. It's not the energy world. It's all of those, and there's something even, like, deeper than that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. You know? So mm-hmm. um, without going into all that, I mean, there's, there are a lot of paths to try and methods to try to understand what that is. And Buddhism, you know, Buddha you know, Buddha is an enlightened being, so he didn't have any limitations, right? So Buddha mm-hmm. was able to see what's going on, and he was able to exposit that. That's another mm-hmm. word, exposit. Uh, he was you know- able to talk about that stuff. <laughs> I uh, are you asking if I know that word? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm is that what you asked me? Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I, just, I don't know. If, I don't. I, sometimes I say words. I think I made, maybe I made them up. But uh, I. That's you know, a, well, I, it, it sounds like it fits. It sounds like it fits, and therefore it sounds it like it fits. Like it fits. <laughs> you know. Exactly. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. Well, one great writing book says make up your words because you know it works. Mm. Um, so <laughs> um, I think it's called. Um, uh, something about rhetoric. Anyway, so so the point mm-hmm. I try to make about Buddhism mm-hmm. is that if we look at the, what Buddha said, you know, the Four Noble Truths, and I go, you can't go into detail on this in a short period, but if you look at these things from the lens of an addict, like say, for example, the First Noble Truth, life is suffering. Life is dukkha. Mm-hmm. It's, it's dissatisfaction. You know, we've got a lot of craving, and, and we don't really get ultimate. We don't really get, it never lasts. It's all impermanent. You know, everything we do... Um, <laughs> comes from a cause, it comes from an impulse, which preceded a cause, which preceded a cause, which preceded a cause. The whole thing is infinite. You can't even trace it back to its origin. We recycle our, our thoughts, our feelings, and our very lives in, in this thing called samsara. It goes back, you know, 5,000 years in, into, the, into the Hindu text, the Vedic text, and stuff, talking about this kind of stuff. So, you know, Buddha, Buddha, you know, showed up in, on the scene and said, hey, you know, look, here's what's going on. Life is suffering. Suffering has a, a cause. Everything that arises, rises from a cause. We can want a different result, make a different cause, right? It's genius. Mm. You want a different result, <laughs> do something different, you know? Mm. So, and here are some things you can do differently. Look at the world correctly, right view. Mm. Speak correctly, right speech, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, the path of Buddhism makes perfect sense for any conscious being, but it makes really great sense for people in addiction because mm. we're so familiar with all of the cycles that Buddha talked about. We're so oh, familiar with the suffering. Got it. Okay. You know what I mean? And if you're yeah. not an addict, if you're, if you're listening to me thinking, well, that, well that, those addicts are crazy. Well, they really did a lot of crazy <laughs> stuff. I, I'm not one of those. <laughs> Buddhism's not for me. You're absolutely wrong because if you just if you just look at Buddhism through the lens of the addict, you can understand it crystal clear, right? Mm, and if you look at addiction through the lens of Buddhism, you can understand your own addiction and your own attachment. So Buddhists should look wow. at addiction and, and addicts should look at Buddhism. And they should read the 12 step Buddhists and the power of vow for what I think are the clearest explanations on that that I've come across. Mm, I, mean, I think I can yeah. stuff pretty clearly, but I could be wrong. No, your your books are. I mean, like I was like I was telling you um, in our earlier conversation we were having. I mean, you're an amazing writer, and um, you you really do go very very deep into Buddhism and um, in ways that it can help people. And um, so um, and I think we should we should mention where can people find your your books. Uh, we've been talking about them. Um, so let's say somebody does want to open that door um, <laughs> and explore more, um, and they want to walk through that door. Um, where can they go next to to find your books? 
Well, you know, like we say in the 12-step community, you've earned your seat, right? I mean, you've mm-hmm. already paid your dues to get here. You, you, you can, you've suffered enough to enter the temple, okay? So when you start mm-hmm. to open up a book or start to look at a teaching, you know, you can have that consideration that this is for you because you're interested in it. If you weren't mm-hmm. interested in it, it would not be for you. So if you're interested in it, pursue it. You can go to, of course, you can go to Amazon.com. 12 Step Buddhist is up there in two formats, electronic and print. It still felt very well after nearly five years. The Power of Vow, I own that. Mm-hmm. I've produced it myself, and mm-hmm. I've got that in Kindle format. Print for, The print book is actually a workbook and study guide with right. question and answer. You can write, write your answers in there and stuff, and it's great for you know going through with a team or with your sponsor, with your, your treatment group or whatever, and treatment providers and, and so on get a 50% discount on those anyway. So... Uh, and then mm, it's also an audio book, as great. you mentioned. So I had yes. a lot of problems getting, getting an audio book made with, with, with Simon and Schuster. They wouldn't, they wouldn't release the audio book rights for the 12-step mm-hmm. Buddhists, and they wouldn't create it. They wouldn't create one. So you know what? Mm-hmm. I own the power of vow. I put it in every single format, and you can mm-hmm. get it really cheap. In fact, mm-hmm. there's a new cool thing on Amazon. If you buy the print book, and this isn't live yet, but it's going to be live soon. If you buy mm-hmm. the print book, you can get a super deep discount on the on the ebook. Oh, great. And I think that's really that's fun. Fantastic. And also, I'm going to give away I'm going to give away the power of vow on the 21st on the Equinox, the 21st and 22nd mm. of September. You can get it free on Amazon. Oh, and wow. Here's the best thing. It, here's the best thing. If listeners can help me out, go to your bookstore, go to Barnes and Noble, or give them a call and say, please order the power of vow by the author of the 12 Step Buddhist, and then they will see that it's available and that people want it, and it will get onto the retail shelf. All retailers, independent retailers, as well as uh, the bigger chains, everybody can order it. They all have Ingram accounts, and that mm-hmm. book is available to any bookstore as well as Amazon. And uh, that's the answer to that question. Fantastic. And um, I hope that people do um, ask for it to be um, carried on the shelves. The 12-Step Buddhist, is that on the shelves? Oh, yeah. It's been on the shelves for years, but it doesn't always yeah. stay – depending on what region, you know. Sometimes mm-hmm. some people okay. still keep it because it's a classic and it's called a backlist mm-hmm. item, but sometimes mm-hmm. you have to order I mean, okay. sometimes on Amazon you can get that book for 2 or $3 because there have been so many thousand copies out there and they're recycled. Mm-hmm. You know, people trade them in, you can get them pretty cheap. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just gonna give. I'm gonna read in case someone's not on your on the show page here. Um, people are listening like on iTunes and all over the place. So, um, your main website is DarrenLittleJohn.com. And, well, yeah, um, that's, and then, that's, that's my main one, but the 12stepbuddhist.com okay. is where all the Buddhist stuff is because my, my uh, main site has my yoga teaching and, and all these other different okay. activities that you mentioned. But, you know, and there's also okay. a site for the power, the power of com tells specifically has excerpts from the new book and so on. Perfect. And so, and so you're saying um, that, that the, it's, so it's called, it's, it's www, right? The 12 step Buddhist 12 is um, like one, two, the 12 step Buddhist.com. Is that correct? That's correct. And if you just okay. Google 12 step Buddhist or Darren little John <clears throat> or 12 steps in Buddhism, my name should come up at the top of the search. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, um, Darren, um, actually I had another question for you <laughs> and this might sound uh, obnoxious, but I'm curious. So the, so the Buddha, so clearly the Buddha is not an addict. So I'm wondering um, what is the, right? I mean, that would be like sacrilege to say that, right? Or or is that energy, like, do we, is it that, that we have all different energies and they exist everywhere? Do you know, what I mean? you know what I mean? Like archetypes. Do the archetypes exist everywhere, even in the Buddha mind or no? Like what is what is going on in the Buddha mind that separates the Buddha mind from from us, if we're part that's, of that? That's, that's, I'm trying to understand your question, but here's the thing. Here's what exists everything exists right everything in the Mm -hmm. phenomenal universe exists all the problems you know all the situations all the illnesses all the sufferings exist it's called you know it's called the karmic or it's called the the desire realm i mean this is where everything's happening at the same time as it exists we can think of it like this it's really easy this way everything exists in emptiness everything exists in empty space so if you think of the buddha mind like infinite unlimited empty space all pervasive mm-hmm. things like mm-hmm. this all pervasive all knowing this is the way they talk about it right 
And you, you think about this. Everything that's material, everything that's energetic, everything that's mental exists, but it all exists mm-hmm. in empty space. So it exists okay. simultaneously. The problem is, you know, so all the archetypes, you know, all the, the addict archetype and the victim and, and the anger and, and, you know, jealousy, all these different archetypes exist, all, these, all this software. It's like all the software in the world, it's like all the Google software, all, all the websites exist in the in the, in the mm-hmm. Space of the internet, you know, or maybe the internet's not infinite, but it's a reasonable mm-hmm. analogy, right? So the stuff right. is there, but it's, it's, it's <clears> the <throat> thing is, is that we're not we're not able typically without some tools, you know, without some instructions, we're not really mm-hmm. able to access access and to penetrate through the delusion. It's like we're it's like we're watching a movie and we think we're you know we th- we, we think the, the zombies are coming for Brad Pitt, you know, and we, <laughs> we start jumping because we need the zombies <clears throat> in the room with us, you know. <laughs> it's just a movie. And if you go to the bathroom and come back, you come back and you look at everybody staring at the movie and and you go, wow, you guys are really into this, you know? <laughs> I can see that it's just a movie. <laughs> you know? So it's like that. You know, we don't necessarily um, just naturally see our Buddha mind, if you will, our Bodhi mind, mm-hmm. our enlightened state. Mm-hmm. You know, but it's, but there. it's still there. It's, it's inseparable. It's, it's inseparable. It's inseparable. It's inseparable. Tell me, mm. tell me one thing that doesn't exist in space. Mm. I don't know. Just get past space. Do me a favor. Get past space. Tell <laughs> me when you get there. You know what I mean? Oh my goodness. I mean, if I light, if, if light can't do it, you know, if light can't do it, you know. Mm. So I mm. feel like. Uh, uh, you know, that's that's a pretty reasonable thing. But, you know, the paradox is that we need to be able to see it and we need to be able to notice it. And that's why we have meditation mm. practices okay. and, you know, all these different guidelines and different different levels of teachings and so forth. Mm-hmm. And so, My next book is going to be about yoga. So, you know, if you oh, want to stay wow. tuned for the 12-step yogi because we're going to be talking okay. about how to use yoga and Buddhism together with 12-step and other tools to evolve to a new level. That I'm really, really excited about putting that one together. Wow, that sounds amazing. And I know that um so I know that some people and you're one of them, right? You incorporate Buddhism um already in your uh, when you teach yoga. Is that correct? How can I not? It's it's mm-hmm. part of me and it's really difficult. You have to be careful how you say things because when you're at twenty four hour fitness you know, which is one place that I teach, you know, you're not going to sit there and go, you know, you guys, Buddha said life is suffering, and, you know, they're going to freak out a little bit. So you kind of have to rephrase things in a way that is palatable, you know, for the person. And here's one of the things. My teacher just said this in his, in his teaching, this live teaching this morning I listened to from Italy, you know. You know, one of the main things, if you're going to open your mouth about teachings, you should open your mouth in a way that people will understand and that mm-hmm. uh, corresponds to their desires, you know. Mm-hmm. And when people come to a typical yoga class, it's different if they come to my retreat because when, when we're on the retreat, like this last one we did at Brighton Bush, our next one's in January. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I, I utilize the stuff from Nikki Myers, the, the yoga of 12-step recovery and so on, where we really utilize, you know, the brain science and the trauma, the ideas about trauma and trauma therapy with you know, yes. mindfulness practice, yoga, movement, breathing, Buddhism, everything and putting all those things together. You come to my retreat, you're, you're there, you know what you're expecting. You right. come to the, to, the gym, okay. to the gym yoga class, you know, <laughs> you might not want that. So, but there's still a way that it's going to seep through. If I open my mouth and I talk about mindfulness, I'm definitely talking about it from the orientation of a Buddhist practitioner and a person mm-hmm. in recovery, but I'm not going to lay it on as thick as, you know, I have mm-hmm. today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, which I think was perfect, actually. Um, so if someone wanted to co- go to a retreat of yours, how would they find out about that and sign up for it? Well, you can, you know, I just, like I said, I just started picking up the podcast again after three years, and um, okay. I'm, I'm doing it like one a week. You can always listen to that on iTunes. You can check the 12 com. There's a okay. Facebook page for the 12 Step Buddhist. Um, there's a group for the 12 Step Buddhist. You can send me an email. You can get it. You can sign up for my email list at the 12 com, And, Perfect. you know, there's a lot of ways to, uh, to stay in touch. And, and I'm going to be doing more retreats and more movement-oriented retreats as well. I'm moving down to San Diego at the end of October. And, That's uh, right. I was Portland. reading that. Yeah, so I'm going to be doing some, some okay. things hopefully in, uh, in a different climates and, you know, maybe some stuff uh, uh, 
uh, you know, in Mexico and stuff like that. We'll see, you know, what mm-hmm. what comes up. But <clears throat> hopefully I'll be doing some more retreats than just the ones I've been doing in Oregon for the past five years. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Sounds amazing. Um, and I just, well, congratulations, um, Darren. It's really been um, just an honor to have you on here. And um, so um, I've been speaking with Darren Littlejohn. Um, he's the author of The Twelve Step Buddhist and of the new book, The Power of Vow. Um, go ahead and um, find both of those on Amazon.com. And also go ahead and check out uh, the Twelve Step Buddhist.com. And um, that's a place, it's kind of like the Grand Central Station place, right, to find articles and podcasts um, that Darren has written. And also, Darren, if someone wants to come take a yoga class from you in Portland, um, where are you teaching again? You said Core Power Yoga? I'm I'm at 24-Hour Fitness and Crunch. They can always find my schedule at DarrenLittleJohn.com, and that'll be good through the end of October. And then you can, then that same website will have everything happening in the San Diego area. Perfect. Um, well, great. Um, well, I can't thank you enough. Um, I really appreciate this conversation, and I hope you come back on again when your um, next book comes out. Um, if there's anything else you want to talk about, so um, thanks so much for being here today. Thanks, Edie. My pleasure. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> 